abductions, reproductions, experiments, memories of seeing children off planet. The idea of humans participating in an alien hybrid program sounds absurd until you talk to the people who've experienced it. Thousands of women, men around the world have had reproductive experiments carried out against their will and unexplained pregnancies that terminate without explanation. In many cases, the memories of what happens remain suppressed and fragmented, leaving experiences confused, depressed, with profound sense of loss. In others, the memories are visceral and emotionally disturbing. Now we have filmmakers, Jim and John, director and producer of the documentaries out and we also have with us today, Geraldine, whose experiences are shocking to say the least, hybrid fetuses taken from her. All of you, welcome right here at Third Phase of Moon. Thanks for being here. Now, let's get to it. I wanna ask you these questions. Can you go into detail when you began to realize that you were being used as a reproductive experiment what kind of tools were used or what was involved? What was the process? Three years ago, I wouldn't even imagine that I would be doing what I'm doing today. Not even a little bit. When I was abducted in 2013, I didn't want to tell anyone about that. I went to bed, everything was normal. And exactly at 3.33 on the dot, I wake up and there's such a bright light. I go to my window and I'm looking through my blinds and I see the light even brighter. And I'm trying to look behind and I'm like, that can't be a car, what is that? And I see metallic and I see the ship. And then I'm looking to this side, light and the ship. And as I'm approaching this, my body just paralyzed, completely paralyzed. And on the other side, there are these six tall shadows that I'm seeing from this light emerging and I'm seeing them walk towards me, this uh, gray. It was a gray with these gigantic eyes. And I'm seeing the other five in front of me, the six is over here. And I'm getting pulled inside the ship and I'm walking in with the being next to me, waves his hand and everything around me changes. And it's almost as if a veil, a very delicate veil is completely ripped open and you can't close it back up again. What surprised you the most when hearing from the abductees and their similarities? You know, I think what surprised us the most when we were interviewing these people were the consistencies in their stories, the similarities. Uh, and I go back to John Mack and Bud Hopkins uh, when they were doing this work in the 70s and 80s. And, and, and they would say in their books, like, they're, the, these, these stories, these people are having very similar experiences and it represents very compelling evidence, not proof, but compelling evidence, because uh, eyewitness testimony is evidence. So when people say, there's, well, there's no evidence. Well, there is evidence. Not, not only is there eyewitness testimony from thousands and thousands of people, but there's also trace evidence uh, you know, th th included, whether it be uh, marks on, bo on their bodies, uh, implants, uh, trace evidence from maybe perhaps landing sites, little things, but uh, it is evidence nevertheless. So we were, when you hear these stories and you hear, you know, the same type of things happening when they're abducted, how they're abducted, uh, kind of how they go through, like when they were kids, they had these weird experiences. And then once they reach their teenage years or early 20s, then they, all of a sudden these experiments, they remember being poked and prodded in a way that would suggest that they were being used in some kind of a hybridization process. So, I mean, when you hear this and you hear this from dozens of people and obviously certainly thousands worldwide, uh, that there is a connection, that there's these pieces of the puzzle uh, that all fit. Uh, and I think that was the thing that really surprised us the most was like, wow, okay, th you're saying the same thing that they said, uh, little differences, you know, in the way they describe where they are, or certainly the ETs uh, that they may encounter. Most talk about the greys, uh, you know, these little gray aliens that we see, we've seen, you know, for dozens and dozens of years on TV and in the movies and in books. Uh, but there's also these reptilians that they talk about, these insectoid creatures they talk about, and also the tall blondes, the Nordic looking, tall, blonde, good looking uh, people 
that that seem to be around uh, when the when these abductions occur and in some cases and this is this is more uh it gets a little uh, unnerving is when they talk about, well, there was a military presence too. They saw people in uniform. So that suggests that the government and these ETs or wherever they are, uh, are in cahoots somehow, uh, that they're working on these things together for a particular reason. Jock, go ahead. Well, the, the, the number one thing for me that uh, resonated uh, as far as uh, their, their stories was the, the emotional, the trauma the pain, the anguish, the frustration, the confusion. Uh, that was consistent across every single story that, that we talked with. It was, again, you know, I'm gonna lean on the emotional side of this because that was what had the biggest impact to me as I heard these individuals share their stories, especially when you're sitting across from them doing the interview. I was living in Manitou Springs and I was dating a woman named Gina. We had a two bedroom apartment, um, ground floor apartment. It was late, we'd gone to bed, and I heard this blood-curdling scream. And I woke up, and I rolled over, and I looked at the clock, and it said 12.36 a.m. And then my girlfriend got up out of the bed, didn't say anything, walked into the bathroom, didn't turn the light on, shut the door, and I heard the toilet seat cover come up, and I heard her sit down, and I was facing the bathroom door, and I thought, that's odd. And then I felt really pulled back into, like, really pulled back into sleep quickly. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and everything in me was an alarm, like danger, danger, danger. And I opened my eyes and standing against the wall next to the bathroom door was this little gray creature. And it scared me really badly. I had a lot of adrenaline go through my body and I tried to move and I couldn't move. And I struggled against that and I tried to fight it. I tried to fight it um, mentally. I tried to fight it physically. Each time I would do this, this gray being kept getting closer to the bed. And as I was getting a hold of myself, this time I came awake, I opened my eyes and I looked right at it. And I heard clearly this time, be still, we aren't here to hurt you. We are only here to check on you. As that was happening, I started to have these flashbacks a flash of being on a gurney being moved down a hallway, a flash of being in a bright lit room, a flash of them being over me, leaning over my stomach, and then it made me panic and pass out again. At some point, this horrific experience ended where all at the same time, my girlfriend throws open the, the door, turns on the light, and I looked over at the clock, and it was like four hours later. I called a friend of mine out of this women's spiritual group in Manitou Springs. I said, please come over, I need some help. Something crazy happened last night. Looks me up and down, she tilts her head and she goes, Sierra, are you pregnant? So I told her everything. And she's like, mm-hmm, okay, yep, yeah, makes sense. And I'm like, would you please just tell me what's happening? And that's when she broke down the whole Zeta hybridization program in detail. And I just sat there shaking my head going, this is a bunch of nonsense. I'm not bisexual. I don't." have a relationship with men, so it's like, how am I pregnant? It was probably about a week, week and a half later, I just, I sat straight up in bed and I screamed. And my stomach was flat and I was like, it's gone. The baby's not there anymore. So, you know, we vetted a bunch of people on the phone. We, you know, got it, narrowed it down to uh, several people that are wound up being in the film. And then we spent, you know, several hours with each individual person sitting across from them with cameras, lights, and a crew and asking questions. And when you're sitting across from somebody and you're asking those questions and you're getting very emotional, very, uh, uh, just the look in their eyes and the pain and the, and the frustration of, of what they're dealing with and why me and how do I, how do I function today? And how do I, how do I make this my, uh, you know, how do I make this into something positive? You know, what is the value of being through, having gone through this? And most of the people that we, that we wound up working with were okay with, with the idea that, you know, maybe my, me telling my story is going to help somebody else. Maybe me telling my story is going to get somebody else to tell theirs. Maybe me telling my story is going to encourage people to uh, formulate uh, a, a, a different opinions. And, and maybe it's going to form a groups of people who get together to talk about their stories so that there is a, a larger community of sharing. So that, that was really important. And I think that uh, uh, you know, that's what I saw as a, as, as a 
over and over again with the people that we spoke to, the people that we interviewed. It was uh, very impactful. The more that we actually learn about the world we're in, the greater the mysteries. One in 50 American adults had experiences that could point to abduction. It's extremely brave for someone to make their story public in this arena. We'd look away and the ship would light up and the next thing it's just boom, it's gone. Men and women have been taken for purposes of reproduction and hybridization. I was abducted. I wake up and there's such a bright light. They would tell me to look in their eyes. They're controlling your thoughts. Inserting this gigantic tube inside of my body, it's painful. I'm now looking who this man is. He is inside of me. It's a screen image of the reptilian. They began the insemination process. A new embryo is created, and that little hybridized embryo already formed is implanted in the womb and she will just stay. They always want the children fetuses. I would go in for my appointment and there would just be no baby. With a very long needle through the belly button, we go into the uterus and they would find the fetus. It holds on to the fetus and pulls out. And then they bring this little girl in the room. And he said that she's yours. This beautiful eyes, this face, and I see myself in the child. She was emanating her feelings. I was shocked. It was nobody's right to impregnate me and use me as a laboratory rat. I went from 210 pounds to 115 pounds. These beings that are doing the abducting don't have the same morality as we do. They don't think what they're doing is wrong. Hearing other people's accounts will make you go, OK, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Who are we serving? We need to ask those questions. Look, human beings take in animals in the wild and bred them. Can we be bred into something different? The answer is absolutely, of course we can. Educate yourself, be open-minded. Don't be dismissive. People have been taken. You can't ignore this anymore. Make up your own mind. Don't let anyone ever tell you how you think. Sorry guys, not all DTs are good. Geraldine, what do you think happens to the hybrid fetus once it's taken from you? Do they develop into human form? Have you been in contact with any of your offspring? So my, so the hybrid children that they take, of course, they um, gestate them for the remainder of the process. Now, in the hybridization program, the woman will incubate that child within the body. Um, the longest that I have heard and um, I have heard limited stories, uh, but my own personal experience is three months. That was the longest I've ever just dated um, a, a, a fetus in my body. And after that, I had the miscarriage. One of the most um, you know, traumatic experiences was that miscarriage is losing um, that. But when they removed it from the body, they take it and they put it into incubation tanks to continue the gestation process. This is also where they genetically modify the fetus because, of course, as you know, we are constantly, um, uh, you know, our, our genetics can be modified depending on our environment. And that, of course, ha the same happens for um, these fetuses that are genetically modified. So they are put into incubation tanks and the gestation process is continued on a craft. Um, some of these hybridization experiments do not make life. Uh, they will perish before, you know, it's time for them to uh, be born. Uh, so in other words, some of these, uh, um, I guess, uh, genetic modifications will not take and some of them will take. And the ones that do are born and they are raised up until a certain age. Now, something that is very interesting to note is that a lot of the children that we come in contact with is normally children, okay? And um, for example, my experience of seeing that child before it was born at an early age allows me to question the timelines or how the timelines are kind of created. Um, for these experiments, okay? So that's something that we need to take into consideration. Um, obviously, they have the ability of manipulating time and space. So um, when we think of the gestation process, the gestation process is also uh, sped up. And I have noticed that as well, because uh, 
when it's developing in the womb uh, during those three months, uh, what I have experienced is that the fetus will actually develop quicker than uh, a human fetus would develop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that is also sped up um, in their gestation tanks. Um, when the fetuses are, are then born and grown, um, of course, they have them on these hybridization ships, uh, which I guess they, they, they train them uh, to carry out whatever program they're looking for. The most significant event that human beings could ever imagine is the arrival, the presence of others who are so far advanced and they're here and they're dealing with us and they've got their own agenda. You know, we acknowledge the UFO problem as, as a real phenomenon. There's something going on. So we have to ask ourselves who's behind it. Is it the Russians? No. Is it the American secret societies? Not entirely. There's a component of otherness to this. And when you get story after story of these abductions, I don't think it's that impossible to believe, to be honest with you. It's a strange kind of scenario, right? But there's been a number of these that have come out through uh, researchers have been dedicated to kind of unpacking this. So I think that there's something happening here. Some of these cases are believable, as incredible as they seem. The individuals, I guess I would say, seem believable. The one thing we have is consciousness. Like that's our secret weapon, is this ability to break those boundaries, to break the matrix. We can all do that. That's actually something every single person can do, is break those chains, those mental chains. The testimony of Geraldine is complex. Along with other abductees, do you see them as victims or somehow chosen because they're special in some way? Uh, Ger Geraldine's story is, uh, is very interesting because of the uh, complexities. And, and I think if, you know, when you hear her tell her side of the story and when you, you hear it in the film or you go to her website or you have an opportunity to hear her speak, you'll realize that she's been exposed to something that transformed her, that she has been uh, awakened or just, not, I wouldn't say necessarily awakened, she's just remembering. She's remembering what she was already connected to. And I think a lot of what we go through is that. So if that makes it more complex and complicated and difficult to understand, so be it. But that's her reality, and I think that that's uh, an important part of uh, uh, you know this story is that sometimes people are going through a transformational process because it's their it's their journey. So you know, are they a victim? Are they chosen? You know, like Jack said, all victims. Everybody's a victim, you know, in some way, shape, or form because in, in our earthbound paradigm, they're being taken against their will. So uh, usually they're not ones that are saying, oh, I had a past life or a previous existence or a multidimensional existence where I uh, agreed to do this or I signed a contract that this was going to be my journey in this life. Usually they don't remember that. So it's not like they're sitting around saying, oh, yeah, I signed that contract. So it's time. It's time for me. I'm, I'm ready to be abducted. They may get connected to that through the process of what they go through, but it's not something that they consciously have a connection to out of the gate. So I, I think it's, you know, uh, they're, they're chosen. I don't know if chosen is the right word. They might have agreed to do it in, you know, that contractual form. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's how they deal with the journey that's the most important thing about it. So you have different people who respond differently. Geraldine's transformation was immense. She left a relationship. She quit her uh, successful career and said that she has to help people because that's what her journey is. She has been. She had seen things that uh, compelled her. The the exposure to the electromagnetic field and the ability to read it is something that she didn't have until it was the the, the switch was flipped. So her journey is very very different from Rob's and very very different from April's. Rob's is more of confusion in connection to his his mantis identity, his mantis mantis uh, mantid consciousness. And uh, he struggles a little bit with, you know, how do I how do I bounce back and forth between the two? I'm connected to something that feels more comfortable out there than it does down here. So there's a struggle there. There's confusion. There's frustration. There's there's this, that sense of isolation that a lot of experiencers feel. And then someone like April, who had traumatic experiences once she connected to uh, uh, the memories. Um, 
but she's chosen to look at it in as a positive light as possible. She looks at it from more of a optimistic point of view uh, and more of a naive wonder, which I think is a good thing. So everybody deals with it a little bit differently. You know, the journey that you have after having something like this happen to you is your own personal journey. There's no one way to go about it. Your thoughts? I see experiencers as both victims and chosen. Uh, they're victims because they're, for the most part, being taken against their will. And I think when you consider that, that just that alone makes them a victim. Uh, how they come to terms with it and how they decide where they're going to put that in their paradigm, it all, it's all different for each person. But in the end, it's a harrowing experience being abducted. Uh, with the exception of maybe a few people who said it was a wonderful experience, but you very rarely, if ever, hear that. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a vic. You're a victim, most certainly a victim, not only of abduction but truthfully rape. Uh, we've heard we in the film a, a couple of the women talk about yeah being we're being raped by uh, an actual whether it's an ET or it's some kind of screen memory of someone doing it. So yeah, that's absolutely traumatic. Uh, but they're also chosen, and what I mean by that is I think that they are chosen. They're chosen based on their family history, maybe, perhaps, uh, or their DNA or their blood type. Um, what we found is in a lot of these cases, there is a, uh, it's multi-generational. So it could be the father had experience or the mother had experience or the grandmother had experiences and now they're having the same experiences. And we also find that in many cases there's a military component. There's a military connection where my father was in the military, my grandmother was in the military, whatever that might look like. Um, so I think they're chosen for a reason and we don't obviously don't know for sure what those reasons are. We can speculate. So yes, they are definitely chosen, but they are most certainly victims and the way they choose to accept it and come to terms with the experiences, uh, varies, uh, with each individual. Obviously people are going to say, did you get any medical advice? Uh, what did the doctor say about this? Do you have any evidence like a monogram of your hybrid fetus inside you? Well, the times that I became pregnant, um, you know, and I would go through the emotional, you know, emotional process of, uh, at first, uh, having unwanted pregnancies, of course, when I was not partnered with anyone and I would miss my period and um, you know I would be very upset and worried and concerned and I would go to the doctor and I would say you know what happened you know I, I don't I wasn't with anyone how can I become pregnant the doctor would say oh you know you're probably stressed out and uh, you probably want a family so much that you know your hormones are acting up and responding to that um, you know and they would tell you tell me things like that um, later on, uh, when I would, uh, when I was 16 years old and I shared the story of myself in Bolivia, immediately after that first insemination, I developed cysts in my womb and I have pictures of that here that you can see. Um, that was a very interesting experience because I also had other medical anomalies that happened at that time, uh, some of which are a little bit private that I don't want to share, but this was something that was developed, which was cysts in the womb, and that did affect me later on during my, um, you know, menstruation cycles. That was a result, direct result, from the implantation of the first fetus within my body. And um, this is quite common. I hear this all the time with other women that have had this hybridization uh, participation. They either have endometriosis, which I do have. This runs in my family. My mother has it. Her mother has it. Um, and of course, it is documented that my aunt as well has been in the hybridization program. And so have uh, other members of my family that have experienced this. Um, so contact is not so far away. And one of the things that is important to note is that uh, hybrid, um, participants in the hybridization program, this happens through your genetic lineage. So it'll be passed down genetically. Your grandmother will have it, your mother will have it, you will have it, uh, you know, I'm talking about myself here. Um, and this is how it happens in families. And I, I tend to see this um, somewhat as a, as a general rule within the uh, people that I communicate with and have been researching. Um, another thing uh, that came up was false pregnancies when I would become pregnant and the gestation process of three months of having, uh, being pregnant. 
um, I think at that point I came to an emotional crisis where I, um, you know, really wanted to have the child at one point um, because of it being such a, you know, emotional roller coasters through the years, whether I was partnered or not partnered. But again, I didn't know or I didn't know what to connect that to, obviously, what was occurring. Um, so when I had the um, m miscarriage at the three months, there was no fetus, there was nothing. It was just like a light period, but there was nothing left behind. So that was a very impactful experience. And I know I hear that from some hybrid mothers that experience that on a monthly basis. What's your opinion of this reproduction experiment project? What do you think their end game is? The end game to this is something we've talked about from the very beginning. When we started, uh, our whole team would sit and talk about when we were shooting the Stan Romanek documentary, you know, what's the end game? You know, what, obviously the end product are these children, are hybrids. And that's very clear. Uh, they might be doing other experiments to, you know, to, to, you know, for the purposes of geology or biology or other biological reasons to just, you know, do research. But these children seem to be the the end result now the end game as to why why they're doing it and there might be more than one program there might be there may be more than one et race that's doing this it seems to be the case so from based on people's testimony so uh, we i think i i'm torn between the two different paradigms and one is uh, this more ascension paradigm where this is I feel like I feel like there's no question that these children are the next step in our evolution in human evolution for whatever reason it could be because this planet's not going to be inhabitable in a hundred years it could be because this is just this was by design and started thousands of years ago that we've been being manipulated from a DNA standpoint for you know hundreds of thousands of years on this planet uh, ever since the primates so there's that part of it that I believe is a part of what the end game is. But the other part, and again, it's a little more uh, scary, if you will, is the idea of colonization, that they're doing this. They're creating these hybrids to take over and eventually take over the planet and be able to live on this planet. Um, and, and we would be replaced. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, I, I, I struggle with that a little more because, uh, and again, just based on what people what, what experiencers tell us for the most part they'll talk about well it's an ascension thing we need to learn from this we need to grow from this this is going to be our future and i hope hope of all hopes is that we do become these cosmic citizens these galactic neighbors of these ets uh, but the reality is some of the things that are happening are not benevolent they're they're extremely malevolent again people are being taken against their will so you know, and I say this and people go, oh, that's a bit much. But truthfully, it's a crime against humanity. These are crimes against humanity. When you abduct tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not a couple million people over the course of 30 or 40 or 50 or more years, that's a crime against humanity. So the means to an end to them might be OK because they think differently. We see we have to we don't even understand how they think. So to them might be worth it. But to us, you know, people are struggling. They have post-traumatic stress, uh, you know, the, the anxiety, the depression, the, the destroyed relationships, the destroyed careers, the destroyed lives. So you, and we, when we don't even know how far that goes, I mean, how just how bad it is for people. So uh, I hope that it's more of an ascension thing that we're going to evolve from this and it's all a good thing. Uh, but there's also elements of it that suggest that it's it's more nefarious and uh, that it might not be so great. Or it might just be that they're they're doing it for their purposes. So they have these hybrids that they can, you know, colonize off world and we'll never even know about it. So uh, it's it's an interesting topic. It's a great dinner conversation for sure. We've had dozens and dozens of conversations about this over dinner. So and other, you know, pretty much everywhere. But um, yeah, I do think it's that's where I would lean towards as far as the end game. John. Yeah, end game is a, a struggling a word that I struggle with a little bit because it, I don't think it's something that we know. 
I don't think that it's something that we can put our finger on. It creates an opportunity for a tremendous amount of opinion and a tremendous amount of opportunities to debate. And there are a lot of people out, out there who are convinced that they know what the answers are. But until there is uh, physical, empirical evidence that states that one, one end game is the end game, we need to look at all possibilities. And because there are different races uh, out there that are uh, executing the agenda, the, the agendas may be very different. So there could be 20, 30, 40 different agendas and the experimentation that's going on with human beings is, is, is different. So, uh, you know, to, to say that we know what the end game is, in my opinion, is it's, that, that's a difficult uh, thing to answer. Uh, but uh, we mentioned this in, our, in, our, in the third film that we're in production, finished production and post-production now, is, uh, is the exploration of three possible uh, outcomes and three uh, different paradigms, which is the biblical paradigm, the ascension paradigm, and the, the colonization paradigm. Three very, very different end games. Uh, but all of them believe in the same thing, that aliens exist, that they're experimenting with uh, human beings, they're creating hybrid children, and that uh, the end result is going to be very, very different. So what is the correct one? I don't know. I, I, I can't say that I have enough uh, uh, evidence to, that one is more realistic than the other. There's ones that feel more comfortable. <laughs> Ascension is definitely more comfortable. Uh, the, the colonization is, is, is horrific. You know, it's, it's basically the elimination of humanity on Earth and uh, basically a takeover. The religious paradigm is uh, the second coming and, and the great deception. So there's a lot of uh, 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 deceit uh, around uh, the biblical paradigm and that we've all been deceived and it's all been a, 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 a lie and struggle with some of these because we don't know what the answers are and that's one of the things I think that's important is to talk about them and I'm glad that there are people out there who believe in all three of these and are telling people that they believe in all three of these and or not in all three of these uh, the people that are um, are champions of an individual belief system and that they they go out and they talk about their belief system so that the more people we have talking about things like this the more conversations there are the more opportunities there are to better understand our place in the bigger picture which is how do we fit in the cosmos you know to think that we're on earth the number one thing in the universe is is i think kind of ludicrous Geraldine, what do you have to say to people who say that you made it up or maybe it's just a dream with no physical evidence? Why should one believe your story? I think I've provided a lot of physical evidence uh, throughout this questionnaire. Um, you know, the kind of this this kind of a topic is really difficult to discuss because in order for me to come out here and share with you, uh, you know, deep, intimate secrets of my menstruation cycle, emotional moments like miscarriages, moments where I had become ill, ended up at the hospital. Um, you know, that is something that I don't think the average person wants to come out and share. Um, so, you know, to those that, that say that, you know, I, uh, I understand that when we hear something foreign, you know, we want to ridicule that, you know, and I think that the part of us that wants to ridicule that, there's a part that doesn't believe it and a part that wants to question that and when we do question it we come into a state of fear because we're entering uh something that we're that's unknown something that we cannot complain and i understand completely i mean uh, i just want to explain that you know in our society this is something that has been heavily suppressed um there are very few books written about this or there, there's very little information about this it's incredibly difficult to get a doctor um, and, a, and a gynecologist to sit there and confirm that this is anomalous activity. Um, and, you know, I, I don't blame them because even in my own personal life, you know, if it wasn't for the regression, it wasn't for the, the memorable experience, um, which happened for me, um, in order for me to recall and make myself go get a, re a hypnotic regression with an expert to understand what had happened in my life and in that experience uh, in 2013, which I also didn't know if I should believe. 
I mean, I thought it was a dream as well at some point. Um, but the fact that it's vivid and the fact that after that abduction experience in 2013, I had the ability of seeing the multidimensional body, uh, you know, right after that, um, you know, that for me is my proof. Okay, um, those kinds of gifts or abilities that are enhanced within the body to uh, psychic abilities, which are automatically in um, uh, you know, created or, um, in, you know, activated in you from one day to the other is not something that can be manufactured or faked. Um, you know, so that's something that I, I now work with people every single day utilizing that tool that was uh, activated after that experience. So, um, and after my regression in 2017, I mean, this was so paradigm shifting for me that I could not go back to a regular life anymore. And my personal life was heavily impacted from these experiences. Um, you know, I ended my relationship with my fiance, um, any idea of getting married and settling down and having a normal life kind of went out the door because, um, you know, I just couldn't understand that in our reality, how is this happening and no one is talking about it? You know, how can it be that I experience having miscarriages, getting sick, having the medical bills to, to prove that and paying those medical bills and the physical um, results of these experiences, this extraterrestrial contact, and yet I can't talk to other people and express what's occurring to me. I don't know where to go. I mean, when that happened to me, I didn't know who to turn to, who to talk to. It's incredibly isolating. Like all things in our culture that are made taboo, there's a reason for that. And we need to start questioning the level of control that is in our society, in, our, uh, in the entertainment industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, and in every, in everything that is managing the structure of our reality is somehow being shifted and changed and inverted to make it really difficult to talk about this. But it's really time. I am not the only person to have these experiences, but I can give up my career, I can give up my life, I can give up everything to sit here and tell you about them because I know that it's important and I know that it's real. So other women and men out there, hundreds of people that email me and let me know about their personal experiences, this is why, this is what I'm here to do and who I'm here to speak to. Um, you know, and really, if uh, based on my research, um, if you go back to the very beginning of time, our his historical timeline, you know, is not the way that we believe it is. There's a lot of things in history that have been shifted and modified to change how our reality is played out. And since the beginning of time, since Mesopotamia, we have been genetically modified, okay? Our race, the human race does not come from apes. It is clearly genetically modified. Just looking at the DNA that has been disproven already scientifically. Okay, so we need to start paying attention to those things that are being slowly dripped into mainstream media and start to put together the bigger picture of what's occurring here. Because it's a it's an actual big thing. And if this was happening to your sister or your brother, um, wouldn't you want to have some answers? Wouldn't you want to understand what's occurring? Um, now, I also want to end this with um, the final note that it is not meant, my, my uh, sharing of my experiences is not meant to cause fear or damage or a feeling of hopelessness or helpless. It's, a, it's, a, it's for education. Because the more we are educated, not just as to the next question, why is the human being utilized for the hybridization program? You will understand that the human has a lot of power in this, that the human has a lot of ability to transform the way that they're experiencing this. And more than anything, the technology of the human body is incredibly um, advanced. And we need to deprogram the false concepts of what the human body is made for so that we can start activating what is truly powerful, what is truly important about this human body and heal, heal, okay? Um, in this time in particular, when we have a lot of deception, it's time for us to kind of unite and uh, listen to each other, listen to each other's experiences and understand what's happening to one another so we can learn more from each other. Is the experience of this phenomenon still happening to you now? And when was your last visitation? 
My last visitation for this um, experience was different and it was not an extraterrestrial experience. It was a military abduction uh, done in the summer of last year um, in Colorado. And it involved two other people that were speaking with me at a conference. Uh, we were taken to an underground base and um, uh, basically taken, uh, had a spinal tap done on the back of our back and this is a uh, very interesting and to to note because the hybridization program is not just utilizing the genetic material and um, you know hybridizing children in the womb this also is a replication program a cloning program that can be done with any part of your genetic material because it can be you know spliced and and they can modify it they can genetically modify it so in this case, I was taken to an underground base in which they removed um, material from my spine and um, the pain was excruciating for months after this experience. I mean, I could not do yoga. I do yoga usually every day. I could not walk. I could not bend my back even slightly because it felt like it would break in half. Um, so, you know, that was something that affected my life tremendously. And this is also something that happened to another family member of mine that lives nearby uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, she had a, a vivid dream about this occurring. Um, they were coming to her, they were gonna inject her. She was trying to say, please, no, um, you know, do not, uh, she wanted to uh, reject what was occurring. And this, um, this being in a white lab coat and another woman in a lab coat, um, you know, forced her to take an injection in her neck and within the next couple hours, she's being rushed to the hospital in real time. And she becomes sick. The doctor can't find um, what's wrong with her. They try to give her antibiotics. Again, they try to uh, you know, do every test possible, blood test this and everything comes out normal. Um, and after a couple of days, she's fine. So, you know, the thing that makes this different, these experiences unique, is that it's combined with a memory. It's combined with these anomalous things that are occurring. You get marks on your body. Um, you know, you're having these vivid dreams of being abducted. You're having the dreams of being in front of uh, extraterrestrials or other beings that are taking something from you or working on you. That is not a normal dream. That is, you know, that is something that is occurring on another physical plane. Um, and if it's affecting you in the physical, you know, that's when we have to start questioning what's occurring. Well, I know there's a lot of people out there that are appreciating uh, your testimony tonight. Uh, not easy. And I consider you very brave for coming out. Can you tell anybody out there who's going through this themselves any advice on what they should do? The first thing I would advise you to do and what has helped me is to question what is true, what is real. Um, I am a person that's very grounded. I need things to be real. I do not like uh, deception. I hate hypocrisy, you know, so I cannot pretend that things are a certain way in my life when they're not. So be really honest about what's happening. Take note, jot down the experiences that you're having, the dreams that you're having, write them down, you know, and it's important to, as a woman, this is for women, uh, that you are recording your cyclical patterns and that you know when you are having these dreams, at what point in your gestation process you're having these dreams, at what point you're having the dreams of being uh, inseminated or there is an extraction being done on your body. This will also help you identify the time in between getting pregnant and when um, the fetus is being removed from your body, okay? Um, any aftermath, any after effects you're having, take note of allergic reactions, anything that's changing in your diet, changing in your um, medical history, like allergies, um, uh, anything that is occurring in the body, like marks in the body. So if you have a dream, this goes for both men and women, that you have been contacted, make sure you are documenting, taking pictures, taking um, a check of your whole body for marks, noticing where the marks are in your body, taking pictures of them and documenting them. In my personal experience, I have had marks, triangular marks on my body. Um, after healing, after healings and the regression, uh, one would disappear and then would come back after a contact experience. So I have had um, 
you know, and molds don't just disappear and come back. Okay, so this is, we're not just talking about regular molds in the body, we're talking about uh, technology. These are implants that are being put in the body. Okay, um, also when you uh, have implants put into the body, notice where it is, check your body. Um, sometimes these implants may move and you may feel them or you, you feel uh, aches and pains in those parts of the body. Like when I had the spinal um, kind of tap, uh, you know, my back was excruciating pain and I had two pin marks um, beside my spine, okay, on the outside. So um, it's important to document. Uh, thirdly, I would say um, try to find a support group in your community. Um, you know, not all communities have them. If you are an experiencer, um, let's figure out how to get one started in your neighborhood, in your community, um, so that we can start creating these outreach programs. I am the founder of hybridmother.com, and it is an international support group for hybrid mothers and fathers. Um, you can message me, connect with me, and we meet once a month to discuss these topics openly and uh, provide support to education. The support and education that I can provide you with is not only my experience and what I have gone through, but connect you with other hybrid parents that have also experienced these things. Uh, for now, I want to leave you with this information so that you kind of can navigate your experiences. Um, please be sure to watch Extraordinary the Seeding out, out September 3rd uh, to see other experiencers like April Malloy and Robert Fullerton. And um, if you have any questions, you can let me know. I'm here to serve and uh, I've gotten a look at Extraordinary the Seeding and uh, there's some very intense moments in regards to some of the information that basically I haven't heard in a while and uh, you guys are really touching a nerve in my opinion and going way beyond the major mainstream and that's a good thing. Where can people see Extraordinary the Seeding? Tell us. The film is available on September 3rd at 12.01 a.m and uh, Eastern Time, and we encourage people to, to check out our website for the film, ExtraordinaryTheSeating.com. It has all the information that you need. You can see the trailer there, and you can also uh, pre-order the film uh, as well. The film really has uh, three essential components to it. It is uh, creating awareness, number one, and sharing something as bizarre as unexplained pregnancies and uh, hybrid children and the fact that there's a program out there where people are being taken against their will and having reproduction, sexual reproduction experiments. So it's important to share it from an awareness point of view. And our objective is to take a subject matter that usually is relegated to the fringes and move it to the center, move it to the masses. We're targeting the center of the bell curve with this film, not appealing to people who already believe. So we want to encourage people to see this film ask questions, have a greater awareness, and, and, and build from there. Go do your own research after that. So the awareness is a big part of it. It's a huge part of, the, of what this film's in, intention is. The second thing is, that, uh, is to have empathy and compassion you know, for the people who've been through these experiences. We can't relate to them if we have never had an abduction experience. Me, personally, I'm not aware of having an abduction experience, but I can sit across from an individual who has had one and hear them share their story over the course of you know, several hours of interview or several hours of phone call and truly understand that they've been through something, although I don't understand what it is, it, there's no doubt in my mind they've been through something traumatic and transformational. So we need to be a little bit more uh, aware of the fact that uh, just because we haven't had the experience doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened to the individual. They've gone through something they can't explain. They have some people have PTSD as a result of it. Some people can't function as easily as they used to before they had their experiences. So we need to be aware of that. We're compassionate toward people who've been through something difficult, whether they've had a death in the family, whether they had a divorce, whether they had a disease. You know, we're there for people who, who are going through struggles. We need to be there for people who are going through struggles as well. And the third thing that uh, we hope to accomplish with the film is to encourage people who have had experiences to seek out community and, and find the people out there who have had experiences too and so that you feel like you're not isolated that you're not alone that there are people who you can relate to who have been through something just like this and um, 
we, we encourage people to find that community. There's a resource page on our website now, the j3films.com slash support. And uh, that is something that we are encouraging people who are watching the film. If you've had an experience and you want more answers, you want to connect to people who may be able to help you, go and visit that website page because there, there will be resources to help you, dis, you know, on your journey of discovery uh, to finding the answers and finding the support groups and finding people who may be able to help you better understand what happened. Thousands of people are going through it every year. Are you? Well, if you have and you want to get answers to what's going on, take a look and check out Extraordinary The Seeding. We'll be supplying the links below. Everybody, keep your eyes on the skies. Be safe. We'll see you again next time. Exciting news. Extraordinary The Seeding will be available September 2nd on all streaming services.